Okay, Newton's third law. Recall from the very beginning of the unit, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The action for action here refers to a force. So for every action force, or for every push, there is an equal, that is referring to the size or the magnitude, and opposite in direction reaction force. If you push on the wall, you feel the wall in your hand, and the thing that's making you feel the wall is the force back on you. If you were to take a shotgun and shoot it, when the bullet went through that extreme acceleration, the force applied to the bullet would be the applied force. The, um, but as it pushes, it pushes back on the gun, and that's why you'd feel a recoil on the gun pushing back into your shoulder. Um, if uh, if a, you take an, a balloon and you blow it up and then you don't tie it off but instead you let it go, as that air escapes out the back, that the um, elasticity of the inside of the balloon is applying a force to that air and that's what's causing it to scoot out the back. The reaction force causes that balloon to shoot around the room and that's what causes the balloon to move forward. So action reaction forces. The trick here is to remember that in the vast majority of cases the force does not act on the same object on the same object okay so for example when the balloon applies that force to the gas the gas applies the force back on the balloon the gas and the balloon are separate objects um, when the gun applied the force to the bullet the bullet applied the force back on the gun separate objects um, sometimes students get confused with this concept because they think if those two forces apply to the same object and they're equal in size and opposite in direction, shouldn't they always cancel each other out? But the force acting on a bullet can't cancel out the force acting on the gun because they're acting on different objects. That's the key to understanding that. One more quick one here that's a weird one. If, the, if you imagine that the uh, force of gravity acting on you when you're free falling or something like that, so here you are, you're far above the earth, Oop, I don't know what happened there, let's try that again, here you are, you're far above the earth, here's the earth, right, and you're falling, there's a force of gravity on you, where's the reaction force to that force of gravity? Believe it or not, you're pulling up on the earth, so the reaction force here is the force of your, that you have that attracts the earth. The trick to understanding that then is that the mass of you might be like 60 kilograms if you're big, and the mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24. So what does that really mean? The mass of the Earth is a little bit bigger than your mass, and so while the Earth can pull you down with an acceler remember that acceleration is inversely proportional to mass, so while the Earth can pull you down at quite the rapid rate, you are way too small to apply any significant force, force to the Earth. Which gets me to my second point here. Why do we ignore this in most problems? Well, there's two possibilities as to why we are able to ignore Newton's third law in an awful lot of problems. Number one, typically in most problems we're only interested in the motion of one object. And so there might be another object that does undergo a motion, we just don't care about it. So we are only paying attention to the motion of one object. The second reason is because an awful lot of action or reaction forces are being applied to the earth or something that's fixed to the earth, like a building or a mountain or something. Um, typically, one of the objects in the force pairing is so large that, the, uh, that any sort of normal applied forces can't cause a significant motion of it. So often we're only paying attention to the motion of one object, but often the difference in masses between the objects
is so large that the acceleration of that object is small enough to be ignored. Okay, but these things aren't always true. There can be situations where you're pushing against another movable object and you would notice. Um, so I think that's worth looking at some problems with. Here's an example. Let's say you're standing in a canoe. Um, you have a mass of 50 kilograms, the canoe has a mass of 25 kilograms. You jump out the front of the canoe with an acceleration of 1.2 meters per second squared. So here's your canoe. looks like a banana I guess and here you are standing on the front of the canoe and you're gonna jump out then if the, if you're going to jump out what you really do is you push back on the canoe causing a reaction force pushing you forward and so if you imagine you 50 kilograms have to have some applied force or that's actually the reaction force right you push on the canoe and the canoe reacts by pushing back on you um, that's going to cause this acceleration of 1.2 meters per second squared. I don't know why I've called, unusually I've called this my positive direction, but that's fine. So what's going to happen to the canoe is the actual action force that you apply to get moving is going to be applied to the canoe and cause it to accelerate at some unknown amount in the opposite direction. See, for every action force is an equal and opposite reaction force. This is true of when we're swimming. What we're really doing is pushing back on the water and then the reaction force is pushing us forward. When we're walking, we're pushing back on the ground and the ground is pushing, the reaction force of the ground pushes us forward. So an awful lot of our motions actually are utilizing Newton's third law. Anyway, um, how are you gonna figure out this acceleration? Well, what we're going to use is the fact that these two forces are equal and opposite. So whatever this force is, this other force is just going to be the negative of that. So using Newton's second law, we can figure out how big that reaction force had to be to cause the 1.2 meter per second squared acceleration. Then we can bring that over to the other side, recognize that that is really just a reaction from original action force, and then go ahead and see what acceleration that would cause on the canoe. That's 60 newtons, and I've called that my positive direction again. That's odd, but that's fine. So what that means then is that this applied force is going to be negative 60 newtons. So if my applied force here is the force causing this acceleration, we have a force of gravity and a normal force of both objects, but we're considering them to be equal and opposite each other out. You wouldn't actually usually call that a normal force. If it's because it's floating on water, you'd call it a buoyancy force. So here the force of gravity and the buoyancy force are canceling each other out. Actually, to be really correct, the canoe is applying a normal force to you, but the canoe has a buoyancy force holding it up. Anyway, that's all sort of beside the point with this problem. We have our mass and our acceleration, so that's a negative 60 newtons. 25 kilograms times A. And A for the canoe is going to work out to be, I think, 2.4. 2.4 meters per second squared in the negative direction here. And the negative simply means that if you jumped out forward, the canoe would end up going backwards because the uh, reaction force, again, is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. All right, one more here. Here we go. This is sort of the opposite of the problem that I was talking about when I was um, coming with this in the first place. So we got a 50-gram bullet. It's being shot into a block of wood, half a kilogram, that is resting on a table. We're going to ignore friction. 
The bullet slows from 50 to rest in a time of 250 milliseconds. Determine the average acceleration of the wood block. So we have a bullet and a wood block. And the bullet is zooming along at uh, 50 meters per second. Not all that fast, actually, for a bullet. And it's going to wedge itself in here. And when it does, it's going to slow to rest. And that is going to take a time of 250 milliseconds, or 0 0.25 seconds. So we want to. What we want to know is the acceleration of the wood. So what we're going to do in this problem is we're going to figure out the acceleration of the um, bullet itself. We're going to take that acceleration and figure out what force the wood must have applied to the bullet to cause that stopping. And then we'll recognize that it's the reaction to that force that would cause the wood to move over and we'll use that then to find out what the acceleration of the block of wood would be. So a little kinematics first. A equals V2 minus V1 over T. Zero minus 50 divided by 0 0.25 works out to be 200 meters per second, uh, second squared negative meters per second. Seconds. Okay. So, if I have a 50 gram bullet, remember in physics we always go to kilograms with an acceleration of negative 200 meters per second squared, then the force that must be being applied to cause that, we can do that with Newton's second law, here we're ignoring the gravitational force uh, even though this bullet's flying through the air. And I think basically what you, the way you should think about this is the gravitational force is going to be small in comparison to the force that's actually going to stop a bullet. So basically we're assuming it's small enough to be ignor ignorable. So here an applied force from the wood is negative 10 newtons. So if the wood pushes on the bullet to stop it with 10 newtons of force, what that means then is that the bullet is going to push back on the wood with the same force. So let's make my, oh, oh whatever, okay. Um, how big was my block of wood? 500 grams or 0 0.5 kilograms. It's uh, experiencing a 10 newton force. That's the reaction to that. Here we did say this is resting on the top of the surface. So there's a force of gravity and a normal force that again are equal and opposite and ignore them. So that reaction force is the net force in this situation. So what that means then is that this bullet would uh, the piece of wood would accelerate at 20 meters per second squared. Now you might be looking at that and going, wow, that's a huge acceleration. That block of wood is going to go flying. Well, if you shot a block of wood with a bullet, it might very well go flying. But the secondary thing to remember is that this is only happening for, 25 millis or for 250 milliseconds. So while it's a fairly extreme acceleration, it's happening over a short enough period of time that you're not actually going to get this, bullet, uh, this block of wood going all that fast. So Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. The two forces that are the action and reaction almost never act on the same object. Gravity could be pulling on you, the reaction is on the Earth. Um, uh, when you push off on the ground, the ground pushes back on you. You and the ground are different objects. We ignore this in most problems because either we don't care about how the other object got pushed back or the other object is so big that you can push back on it no matter how hard you want and it ain't going anywhere. And then we looked at a couple problems. The general pattern here being 
use the information for one object to figure out what the force applied to that object must have been, recognize that the reaction force is acting on the second object, and then use that to find the acceleration of the second object.